supposed to do at work? Uh, where do you spend most of your time during the day if you're working? At work, right? If you're retired, that's a different story. You know, God bless you. you have, now you serve the Lord completely. Now you just 24 hours Jesus. But if you're working, oh, good. But if you're working, that's where a lot of the time that you're going to spend. So what is a Christian to do at work? How is his behavior? How is his attitude toward work? How is he supposed to look at work? How is he supposed to look at relationships? How is he supposed to look at other things? So we'll be talking all about that. And if you think, ah, I've been a Christian for 10 years. I don't need to know any about this. Well, hopefully you're firmly rooted. And hopefully you're firmly walking with him. Uh, otherwise, uh, you, should, you should be here. And we'll ask some, you can ask a lot of questions. That's the nice thing about the study. You can ask a lot of questions. If you want to know who Cain, uh, where Cain got his wife, you can ask me later. Uh, but that's usually one of the questions people have. Uh, we'll be dealing mainly with justification, sanctification, glorification, the aspects of salvation first. Then we'll move on to more practical things. So doctrine, practical, it's beautiful class. Wonderful class, firmly rooted. We're in Ephesians today. Let's pray. Lord, in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake, we thank you for today. May your spirit, Lord, uh, speak to our hearts. May your grace, Lord, go deep to the innermost parts of our being, to our spirit. May your grace, Lord, dwell there. And may we live in accordance to the grace that we've given. We've been giving grace and mercy. And we're to respond to it, Lord, by faith and obedience and love. So, Lord, may we have more understanding of that today. May we draw closer to you, Lord, as we read your word. And among fellowships and believers, we thank you that we have our Bibles today. By all means, Lord, we thank you that we have our Bibles and we have your word and we have the truth. Lord, now we ask that you would help us to hear the truth and act on it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Alive in Christ, Ephesians 2, let's read verse 1 together, or let's read verse 1, not together, because we have, maybe have different translations, it may sound a little bit different, but let's read verse 1, and you who were dead in your trespasses, and um, I'll be interjecting a little bit here because it's, it's, it helps to, some of our translations don't have exactly how it's supposed to be read, but who are Literally, you were being dead, or are currently dead, uh, or were once dead. So it, it encompasses a lot of things. Who were once dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world or this age, according to the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, among them... We too all formerly lived in the lust of the flesh, of, of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and in the mind and of the mind. And by nature we were children of wrath uh, or, or disobedience, even as the rest. But God, wonderful word there. We're going to spend some time on that word. Three simple letters, but but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, which, with which he has loved us, or he has not only loved us in the past, but he's continuing to love us, even we were dead in our transgressions. He made us alive with the Messiah, Jesus. By grace, you have been saved and has raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus in order that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. We'll spend some time on that verse because it is very important that we get that verse right. Uh, in what Paul is saying, what is the gift of God? Right? What is the gift of God? Not as a result of your works, that no one should boast, but we are his workmanship, literally the word poema, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we've been reading Ephesians, and you've been traveling with Paul through uh, Ephesians. We read that Paul got to the church of Ephesus. He planted the church of Ephesus, spent three years with them, gave them Lots and lots of instruction, lots of teaching. Imagine 
if we're talking about firmly, firmly rooted, if Paul was teaching that class, I think we all show up. Right? We all show up. There's so much to learn from Paul. But here is Paul, physically not here, but he's here through the letter, the letter of Ephesians. And he wrote it from prison, and he was concerned about the Ephesians and uh, some of the things that were going on in the area. And this letter is a, called a general letter, so it was supposed to be read by all the surrounding churches. Ephesus was the largest one. And Paul's emphasis through this letter, of course, is in Christ. In Christ. That's where we need to be, in Christ today. Not just in church. Not just in uh, service. Not just in fellowship. For all those things draw from the one thing that you're to be in, in Christ. And Christ has been seated at the right hand of God. That was chapter 1. He's been seated in the heavenly places, high above everything else, and that has been the mystery. The revelation of Christ in the mystery has been revealed. The Christ Jesus has come into the world. He has saved sinners. He's lifted us up. He has revealed himself to us, and God has lifted him up in high places, and we've been chosen in him for to be, to be holy and blameless before him in love. That was his choice. And that is our response to him. And we've been studying that in chapter 1. But chapter 2 continues with this idea. But Paul goes in a different direction now, going back to our previous life. He's talking to Christians, and he's talking to all of us. So it's not just you, it's all of you, y'all, right? Texans like to say, all y'all, everybody, right, everybody. And he begins to talk about the things of sin, and he mentions sin quite a few times. And the question has always been this. What went wrong with our world? People ask this question all the time. Especially unbelievers. They look at the world and they go, how can this be? And that's one of the reasons people fail to believe in God is to say, look, if God is so good, why is the world in such a mess? And it is in such a mess. I don't disagree with them. And the, the world is dangerous and it's getting out of control. And there have been times like that, and people say, oh, Pastor, you, know, you weren't around when that happened, and that happened. But not all these things happen at the same time. This is a different time. Uh, and even people have to agree with the fact that maybe there were things bad, but not all at the same time. And this is what we're going. We see the trajectory of the world. People have answers to this, right? Oh, it's poverty. Oh, it's lack of education. Or it's oppression. Uh, it's ignorance. We just need to teach people the right things, and people will be fine. But the reality is, that doesn't solve people's problems. And so the problem is not just in the world. The problem is the people in the world. And people say, oh, yeah, that's right, the people in the world. There's dictators, people out there marching and protesting and burning cars and setting the world on fire. Those are the real problems, right? The thieves, the opportunists, those individuals, the communists, the capitalists, all these people are bad. But the reality of it is, we belong to those people. We belong to that humanity. And what Paul is addressing here, he's not going to blame the systems or the, you know, people blame the system. Oh, it's the system, brother. Don't worry about it. It's your work. It's your environment. It's where you live. Paul is going to address one thing, the man or the woman in the mirror. It is you. That is the problem in the world. The problem in the world is us. And if that's where we belong to, we belong to humanity, and there's something wrong with humanity, then what is wrong with me? What is wrong with me? Well, people won't admit to that, right? Because you mentioned that and go, oh, nothing's wrong with me. Something's wrong with you. It's not wrong with me. People get defensive. But just like a doctor, Paul is going to address this. I studied science when I was younger. And one thing they taught me in epidemiology, meaning how to find a disease and how to deal with the disease is this. You need three things. You need to find out what the disease is. Simple. Right? Then you find out, what is disease going to do to you? Is it going to kill you, or are you going to live with it? And finally, you need to find a cure. You need to find a cure. And those are the very things that Paul is going to address here, is we're going to have to go to the diagnosis. What is wrong with you? What is wrong with me? Prognosis. What's going to happen? We found out you have something. What's going to happen? And finally, what's the answer? Because you can do the first two and be like, well, there's a problem. People love to find problems, don't they? Oh, man, find point a problem, find a problem. But they very much failed at finding a solution. But God's not like that. God is going to give us a solution as well as the problem. 
And the problem can be seen as a disease. So I'm going to take it from a, if you bear with me, a scientific aspect of it. What is the disease? John Wesley, a famous preacher 200 and some years ago, so almost 300 years ago, used to say this to people that he would meet, know your disease and know the cure. Know the disease and know the cure. Well, what is the disease? The disease, my friend, is found in verse 1. Look at me again. You were once dead in your trespasses and sins. That is the disease. That is the problem, right? And the Bible never calls it a habit. The Bible never calls it uh, some kind of a fault or a vice or a crime. Uh, because a lot of people like to say, well, that's just my, that's just me. You know, oh, that, that's just who I am. That's just, that's my vice. That's my, that's my fault. You know, it doesn't deal with that. It deals with one specific thing that nobody likes to talk about. Sin. S-I-N. Sin. And sin, according to the Bible, here, is a very deadly disease. And the bad thing about it is every single person has been infected by it. Every single person has been infected by it. And here this deals with the word trespass. Sins and trespass. Not only missing the mark, that's sin, amarteo. To miss the mark means that God had intended purpose for your life and intended gold for your life, and you missed it. You missed it completely. You fell short of it, however the Bible describes it. It's like it was used in the ancient times for an archer. You have an archer would shoot at something, at a target, at a bullseye, and he missed. There will be somebody who would say, sinner, you missed it. Now, they didn't cry about it or get mad. They simply tried it again, right? Not like us. You call me a sinner, man. We simply mean you failed to meet what God wanted you to be. And how many of us can admit that, that God had an intended purpose for us? And we failed, we missed it, we tried. <laughs> Pastor, I tried so hard. And that's what the problem is, right? The inability to hit it, the inability to hit the mark. The other word is trespass. And this is more deeply rooted in us, and that is the idea of you know something is right and you don't do, or you know something is wrong and you love to do it. You trespass. You Go beyond the limits of where you're supposed to go. You climb where you're not supposed to go. It's forbidden. You're not supposed to go there. But, man, we're going to try hard to get there. We're going to climb that fence. The Bible uses another word, a lawbreaker, right? A lawbreaker is someone who disobeys, simply disobeys what the laws have been established. That's what we are. We have missed the mark. We have failed to meet God's standard, which the standard is perfection, by the way. If you were trying to... Be technical, the standard is perfection. Oh, pastor, I've missed that one a long time ago. Yes, we all did. Trespass. You did what you weren't supposed to do. Now, I ask you how many of us missed that mark. How many of us have done things that we're not supposed to? We just overstepped the boundaries. We knew. And sin and law-breaking is not only doing what God said not to do, but also our conscience. You did things contrary to what your conscience said. And very early on, you, you had a conscience. You knew. As a kid, I knew what was right, what was wrong, without anybody telling me. I just knew you weren't supposed to be mean to people. You weren't supposed to do that. It was just something innate in us, right, to say, I shouldn't kick that guy's butt. I shouldn't, you know, I shouldn't punch him in the face. I shouldn't pick on him. I shouldn't pull the little, you know, the little girl's ponytails, you know, when you're a kid and you pull on you. Know, I wasn't supposed to do that. But we did. And then, but then it got worse, didn't it? Because it wasn't just so innocent of just, you know, kindergarten stuff. It became more things that were more detrimental to us and more sinful and more hurtful to others. And so this disease is personal. Not only every one of us, and you can say, oh, pastor, everybody has sinned. Yes, but it's each and every one of us. It's not just every one of us. It's each and every one of us. That means it's for all humanity, but individually for you as well. So you're in that you, right? The disease is personal, but Paul's going to deal with this. So what is the symptom? Let's deal with the first verse here real quick, verse 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. How do you know somebody has sinned? You know, the first thing that Paul says, the character of that sin is death. Death. That person is dead. If you have sinned, you are dead. Now, they could be doing a lot of activity, and you see a lot of dead people being active, and alive, physically active, doing things, but in terms 
of God in spiritual things absolutely dead. How do I know this? Bring up Jesus to someone who's dead in sin. It was almost like a reaction. Talk about the Super Bowl. Talk about movies. Talk about the, oh, man, well, ooh, who's going to win? Ooh, yeah. And it's like they become alive. Why? Things of God, things of the Spirit, dead. Things of the world, things of sin, things are like that. Ooh, yeah. What's going on there? You know somebody is sin because, or somebody is dead because there's no room for God. There's no room for Jesus. There's no room for talking about that. It almost seems like you have to apologize when you mention Jesus to someone who is dead, right? But the characteristics of somebody who's dead is this, cold, cold, spiritually cold, right? They may come to church. You may come to church, but you're cold toward God. You'd rather hear things about other things. I can't wait for this thing to be over so you can do the things that you really want to do because you're cold toward the things of God. There's no warmth in the worship. There's no warmth in the affection of God. There's no, warm, no warmth in the, the desire to know God, right? And that's what makes a person <laughs> dead, immobile. They can't do anything about it, right? A corpse can't respond. Another thing that happens is corruption, decay. It actually, it gets worse. You ever had a tooth decay? Same idea. It gets worse. If you don't deal with it, it just gets worse and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. That's the decay. Until it perishes. Until it completely perishes and is completely dead. The story of the prodigal son is so key to understand this. Because when the prodigal son comes back, what does the father do when he welcomes him? Right? Isn't that the beautiful thing? He throws himself at him. Right? He loves him. And then he tells his son, he, my son, the other son, my son was dead. He wasn't dead. He would say, Pastor, that's wrong. He was alive. <laughs> he, was, he was doing all the crazy things, nightclubbing, prostitutes, all these things, right? He seemed to be alive. But the father knew he was dead. He said, he's now alive. And so anyone he's shared the gospel, you, you know this is, this is firsthand. You meet somebody, you talk to them, and you're like, they seem like they're not even responding to me. They seem like I could have talked to a wall, and I would have gotten more out of that wall than out of that person. And it's true. Why? Hey, don't get frustrated, by the way. They're dead. They're dead. How can you get mad at somebody who cannot, in their own possibility, even, even completely respond to that? Well, we need to pray. When you go out sharing, don't you pray? God, give them ears. <laughs> give them eyes. Give them something. Because it's only God who's going to make that person be able to respond to what you have to tell them. So verse 2, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. How did people get like this, you would say? How did, how did we have a bunch of dead people in the, in the world walking around? Pastor, there's a problem, right? It's a big problem. But how did this happen? Three things Paul is going to say, right? You're dealing with the symptom. How do they get it? When you talk about disease, one thing they teach you is you need to find out where is the root of the problem, right? The root of the problem, where did, where did the disease come from, right? There's an outbreak. Well, where did it come from, right? You know, I don't know hear that. If there's a problem, you know, they got to find out who was the student who caught it and, 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 and how it spread. Well, here Paul tells you three things. Where the disease came from, number one, the world. The course of this world or this age According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. Number one, the world system. The age of this system, the, the age in which you live in, the world system, it's the first thing Paul mentions, right? The source. We live in a world infected by disease. It's in the world. And, and we're not talking about the earth, so switch your gears. Not the earth, not the plants, not the trees. The system, the philosophy, how people view it. Uh, the world is spiritually dead, and by being in the world, you are spiritually dead by contact with it. It's simple, isn't it? Paul is just addressing the issue. We become dead because we're in the world, right? We live in a sinful environment. We live in a system that is changing you, wanting to conform to that system, wanting you to conform to that system, and it's dead. And the pressure, and the pressure that is on people to conform to this, I wouldn't want to be a teenager today. Forget being young, you know, the pressure of the system of the world to conform you. 
things I'd never had before. Things I, I, you know, there was pressure. There was always pressure. But today, it's, it's like it's ramping up, the pressure, the conformity. Why? Wanting to be like the world, to fit in. The pressure is so strong. Any young people here? Right? Any young people here? Amen. Right? Amen. <laughs> to conform. The pressure, right? The pressure of friends. The pressure of society. The pressure is strong to be in that disease. And you really can't resist it. You really can't resist it fully. Now, we're talking about where did the disease come from, right? Many people succumb to this. Number two, Paul says, the prince of the power of the air. Where's the other source of sin? Satan. This is his age. This is his world, right? Um, but evil is so alive and well today because the devil has organized and the devil has set up things in the world so that you and I can actually sin. That's what Satan wants. Satan wants you to sin. Above all things, he wants you to sin. Right? Who is responsible? Satan. Who is to blame? Satan. Now, we're going to get to the third one because it's not to say the devil made me do it. But it's not to say just the world. It's not to say, well, just the environment. But the one who's in charge of the environment. That's Satan, right? And he's called the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. The sons of disobedience has to do with the devil is working in the world to bring people to sin. That's the point, right? The influence of Satan, and uses that word air to talk about like the atmosphere. You're just in the atmosphere of sin, not only in the world, but you're in the atmosphere of sin because of Satan. Satan is influencing societies, world, politics, fashion, movies, entertainment, you name it. He's influenced it from the back and drawing people to come against Christ. Now, the Bible says in another passage in Corinthians that he blinds people. So even if you tell them, you go, ah, come on. That's a conspiracy. No, it's true, man. It's, it's the devil. He's working. Look, at, look how he set it up in your life. He's setting you up to go this way. He's setting you up to go that way. Nah. And people don't believe in it. In fact, the church has stopped believing that there's a personal devil. Over 65% of, of Christianity, Christianity, uh, does not believe in a personal devil anymore. Just an idea or, or a philosophy or, or some sort of you know, ancient ideas that somebody had to personify evil, but they don't believe in a personal devil. Now, you've got to read the scriptures and you find out Jesus was not fighting against a, an idea or a philosophy. He was talking to a real person. And that's the person of Satan, right? He is what Jesus called him, the prince of this world, the ruler of this age. Paul, in another passage, says he is the god of this age. And his ambition is to make you sin. His ambition is to make you sin. Because if he can make you sin, he can turn you against God, he can numb you against God, and he can keep you from God, and he can keep you from Christ, and he has you right where he wants you to be. And he's very powerful. Don't underestimate that. Oh, pastor, come on, we just have to you know, take authority over him. No, he's very powerful. Very powerful over the things that... I wouldn't want to go up against Satan. Only Christ can go up against Satan. And only in us in Christ can deal with Satan. We'll get to that in Ephesians 6, by the way. Paul is laying down the groundwork for the idea of spiritual battle. But here it is. He's the father of lies. Boy, he's good at lies, isn't he? When I was not a Christian, I believed everything was a lie. Everything was, I believed was a lie. And so did you. <laughs> Things about love. Marriage, right? society, relationships, science, all was completely a lie. And it was becoming a Christian that actually undoes all that stuff. You actually have to undo it and, and relearn life through Christ. And so Jesus lets us know that he is a very powerful creature. In fact, he's the most powerful creation of God. The most powerful creation of God. So don't underestimate the fact that he is powerful, that he is a liar, right? And people want to say, well, if I could just leave the world, if I could just leave the atmosphere, if I can... No, you carry it with you because the third problem that Paul says, you know where sin comes from too? And among them too, we formerly, verse 3, lived in the lust of our flesh. You can try to escape the world. Not going to happen. <laughs> not, not very easily. You can try and escape the influence of Satan. He's a very powerful being and he's invisible and he can travel very, very quickly. But you can't escape yourself. 
You cannot escape yourself. The third source of sin, your flesh. Now, we've said this in Galatians. So I don't have to belabor the point. It's not your physical body. Right? It's not your physical body. It's how you think. It's how you were in the, the things you inherited from your parents, right? And, and we talk about the deeds of the flesh, but it's also not only the deeds of the flesh, but it's how you behave, uh, what you inherited when you were born. And the most disturbing thing to realize, I have five kids, the most disturbing things you realize is when you sit down with your kids and their behaviors and characters are the things you hate about you. Amen? Nobody? Okay, well, there's just me then. I, I look at my kids and I go... Nobody taught that person to do that. Nobody taught her how to do that. No, wait, I've seen that behavior before. Oh, I heard it. And it sounds just like my voice, right? You ever had that? Oh, we might have good qualities that passed on, you know, that maybe intelligence, maybe, uh, you know, some, some form of generosity that is passed on, maybe a sweeter nature than others. But, oh, when you see the behaviors, it scares you to death. I go, how did that happen? You know, who put that in you? And the reality is, well, I got it from someone. <laughs> I got it from my parents, and their parents got it from them. And it goes back, back, back to the inheritance that came from Adam and Eve, right? And the first thing you notice with kids right, when they're growing up is self-will. <laughs> self-will. And nobody had to teach them that, right? You ever deal with that? A three-year-old, four-year-old that just wants to have it their way? And you're like... That's just like my wife. And I, is she here? Okay, good. That's just like, that's like, how did that happen? You know, self-will, stubbornness, you know. That's like you, you know. And you go back and forth, amen? That's a, <laughs> one brave soul, right? Um, but it's true, isn't it? The things we hate about ourselves are found in our kids, whether it's their lying, whether it's their temper, whether it's their mischievousness, you know, it's just like, mm, but I can't blame them because I was just like that. <laughs> and I go, oh, who can deliver us from this body of death, right? It just seems like, and they're going to pass it on to their kids, and it's going to grow on, right? And so those ideas, right, it's not just the desires, inordinate desires, but the ideas, how we think about things, right, all comes inherited as a natural person, to think differently than God, to behave differently than God, right? And so these cravings and ideas, right, all leads us to what Paul says here, of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Don't ever think it's just the body. It's also the mind. It's how you think, how you relate to the world that you, you, that you see. And we're by nature children of wrath. How serious is the prognosis? Children of wrath, even as the rest, sin, my friend, will kill you. Sin, my friend, will kill you, right? Uh, the prognosis is this. It's, you know, people say, oh, pastor, it's a general condition. Everybody has it. Come on, everybody can live with it. It's true. People can live with it, but it eventually is going to kill you. And it's going to kill you forever. And it's going to kill you forever. And Paul says, this disease is going to lead you to one thing, the wrath of God. You see that word there? Children of wrath. The word there is orge. It's the wrath of God. Now, God is, there's two types of wrath of God. One who's, one wrath that's simmering. You ever, you ever had something boiling in your kitchen? You're putting it on and the water's boiling. And the other wrath is the wrath that it's outpoured. It's when the pot just cannot handle it anymore. The heat is too much and it just explodes, right? One is the wrath of God boiling, and the other is the wrath of God poured out. The Bible says unbelievers are under the wrath of God now. Well, how does that wrath of God work? The wrath of God, you have to read Romans 1 for that. And Romans 1 tells us God is, God's wrath is revealed. And you know that God's wrath is revealed when society, it is absolutely without God, and God has taken the brakes off. And society goes shoom, right into more sin. They grease the wheels, and it's just flowing right along. And that is the wrath of God. How do we know you're under the wrath of God? Well, I'm not under the wrath of God, am I? Well, when God takes the brakes off of your life, 
and you get away with sin, and you continue to get away with sin, and you move on with sin, and it gets worse and worse, God has taken the brakes off. And that is the wrath of God, my friend. And people are experiencing the wrath of God today. But it's simmering, meaning that it's almost invisible. You have to look at it spiritually to say, is that the wrath of God upon that person? He's getting away with sin and nothing happens. He just, it's like God just let him go. That's a terrible thing. The other wrath of God is what Paul is referring to here, is the boiling wrath of God, is God's anger towards sin. And we're under his wrath. We're under his wrath so much so that there'll be a day coming when you will experience that wrath of God fully and on you for the sins committed. Now, the best illustration that I can think of, because I thought about this, is Pilgrim's Progress. And in Pilgrim's Progress, if you've read it, if you haven't, I encourage you to do it. Now, sell your shirt and go get a book. And if you don't have one, Sheila, do we have a copy of that? There we go. No excuse. It's also on YouTube. No excuse. But when I say, hey, remember Pilgrim's Progress? You can say, oh, yeah, I read it. Christian, that's his name. Not him, but the guy here. And uh, Chris is his name, and he's got a burden, a big burden. How did he know he had a burden? He lived with it for a long time, but he realizes that he's got a burden now. How did he get to that burden? He read the Bible. He was reading the Bible, and that burden became heavier and heavier and heavier. Why? Because he realized that he lived in the city of destruction, and the city was going to be destroyed by the wrath of God. And he went around telling people, and finally he met an evangelist, Mr. Evangelist. And what did Mr. Evangelist say? Anybody who read the book? What did he tell them about the city, though? That's right. Get out. And he says, quoting from the Bible, Luke 3, flee from the wrath to come. Flee from the wrath to come. Now, he can get out of the city, but he hadn't escaped the wrath yet until he went to the cross. And that burden just simply fell off of him. And the sins were taken away, right? But he was told, flee from the wrath to come. Flee from the wrath to come. And that was uh, any evangelist, any people sharing the gospel with somebody. That is the message to tell people. My friend, my loved one, honey, sweetie, mom, grandma, there's a day. There's a day of reckoning. There's a day that's coming. You may not see it today, but there's a day coming. And that is the day that everyone that I meet, I hope for them not, for them not, to, not to ever go into that day, to escape that day. Get rid of that burden before it's too late. Look at verse 4. Something happens, though. But God. But God. God is rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us. Here's the prescription, right? So we know what the diagnosis is, sin. We know what the prognosis is, wrath. So sin leads to death and it leads to wrath. So if you're caught with sin in your life, there's a progression that you can't stop because it's a disease. Everybody has it. And that prognosis is going to lead you to death. But what is the solution? But God. But God, who's rich in mercy. And the prescription is so beautiful here. Uh, instead of death, instead of death, he is going to give us life. Look what it says, verse 4. Rich in mercy because of his great love, even which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive. God's solution for dead, for death, is alive. Simple, right? God's solution for death is alive. How does he do that? Well, we were once dead, and you hear the testimony of someone, or you hear the gospel, and God begins to work in your life now. And now instead of being dead, you're quickened. There's an instant when you begin to, huh, that makes a lot of sense. I never thought about that way. Oh, maybe I've sinned. Maybe I'm wrong. And here's God's solution, right? And somebody can go to church all the time and still be a corpse, by the way. You can go to church for the rest of your life and still be dead. It's only when God brings life, right? And that life is resurrection. That life is resurrection. So here's God's prescription. I found this little thing. Was, yeah, that's the great physician. He's got a thing. He wants to tell you. You want the solution? Jesus, not just his resurrection, but your resurrection. He has made us alive together with Christ. By grace, we have been saved through faith. Amen. 
A man cannot be reformed, right? A man cannot just, you just do this, do this, and you'll be fine. A man cannot be educated. A man cannot just be, uh, be brought into something, just do good works and you'll be all right. A man has to be raised from the dead in order to be alive. Because the problem is death. See, if you try to reform somebody, you think he's alive. All you need to do is just go back and do good things and he'll be all right. But the problem is he's dead. It's dead, dead, dead. And the word here is, uh, Paul is reminding us that he is, even we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive. It's a beautiful word. It means to be quickened. Uh, Suddenly, you are awakened. Whoa, there's the truth. How come I never saw it before? It's been staring right at it. You would say, well, man, my family's been Christian for a long time. How come I never heard it? (laughs) Well, you did hear it. You just were dead. You did see it. You were just dead. A dead person can't hear, a dead person can't see, a dead person can't move. It requires God to quicken, made alive. He made alive together with us in Jesus. Christianity began in a cemetery. Christianity began in a cemetery. It didn't begin in a church. It didn't begin in a social place. It didn't begin in a palace. It didn't become in a kingdom. It became alive at a cemetery. That means that those who were dead are made alive. I don't want to have show of hands because I, 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 I want to make it as, as most convicting and most powerful than anything, not contrived, right? But were you dead? Do you remember being dead? Oh, isn't that just, you just can't believe it. You can't believe you were dead because nobody would convince you you were dead. <laughs> you, no, people came to you. Hey, this is the truth. I go, no, ah, I'm going to follow Gandhi. I follow Buddha, follow this, Jehovah's Witness, whatever it is. Ah, whatever. And now you're alive and you go, oh, how did I see it? He quickened you. He made you alive. And not only that, Jesus was made alive. Christianity is about raising people from the dead. That's the point. You're dead. (laughs) Christianity would not exist and let God raise somebody from the dead. That was Jesus. And since then, he's the first fruit. And from that point on, everybody who comes to Jesus must be raised from the dead. Now, we'll have a physical resurrection, but Paul here is dealing with, and what God's dealing here is, you're spiritually dead, and you need to be made alive. But you can't do it yourself. You can be reformed to it. You can be educated by it. You can't have, you know, go to the gym for it. You have absolutely has to be God. It has to be God. How does God do it? Through the gospel. That's why it is of utmost importance that we not only know the gospel, live the gospel, but tell people about the gospel because it's the only thing that's going to make them alive. You try to bring them to church. Hopefully they hear the gospel. I'm not, I'm not denying that aspect of it. But if you think, man, I took them to church, nothing happened. Probably they didn't hear the gospel or they didn't care because they're dead. But you could tell them and you can tell them. And you can remind them, and you can tell them, and that's the point. And don't get upset, they're dead. Remember, do not get frustrated. It's the first thing that happened, oh man, nothing happened. Yeah, they're dead. I told them again, they're dead. Why don't we pray that God quickens them? That's the point. God quickens them, then they can hear, and maybe they could respond. Now, how high did he raise us? Well, he raised Jesus so high, he put him right next to him, right? made us alive together with Christ by grace you've been saved and raised us up with him, verse 6, and seated us with him in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. It's so tremendous. He's lifted Jesus up and he put him up, 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 up. And he says to you, I'm going to put you up there with him. I'm going to raise you up like Christ. I'm going to put you right next to Jesus. Seated with places in Christ. What? Me? Of all people? Can you imagine? Me, right? The things I've done, said, and not done. And God said, I'm rich in mercy. I'm going to give you that mercy. And not only forgiveness, but I'm going to sit you with Jesus. Let that sink in for a minute. <laughs> you might be seated here at 1431 DeVore Road. You might say, man, I can't wait for this to be over, but I'm seated here. But in reality, you and I, are seated with Christ Jesus in heavenly places. Oh, pastor, come on. You don't know my problems. You don't know my thing. That's because you're focused on earth. You're focused on temporal things. 
If your mind was focused where Christ is seated at, you'd be riding above those problems, right? I got no problems. I'm seated with Christ. I'm in traffic. No problem. I'm seated with Christ. I'm doing the dishes. No problem. I'm sitting with Christ. No? Man. All right, good. Um, what else? I'm doing homework. No problem. I'm seated with Christ. Everything changes when you're seated with Christ. You're in that terrible problem, terrible trial, terrible things that you're dealing with. You can't find your way out. Paul says, put your mind on things above where Christ is seated at, in heavenly places, or above this world. The world can't touch us. We're in heavenly places. Satan can't touch us in Christ. Now, we're going to get to that in chapter 6 because we also have to fight this battle, don't we? It's not just a, hey, I'm done. I don't have to worry about it. Because Paul tells us we have to fight the battle with demonic spirits that are also in high places. So that The battle just begun. <laughs> you were dead. <laughs> you weren't even part of the battle. You were just like, Satan's got you going, got you wrapped up, put you away. I don't have to worry about you. But now that you come to Christ, there's a real big concern for Satan. How about you? That's the battle. Anyway, we're, we're continuing on. Verse 6, we're seated with places in, in high places with Christ Jesus. Absolutely. Life and resurrection. Life and resurrection. Where did we get this from? Jesus. What's the solution? Christ. Resurrection. But look at this. Paul is going to say, how, do we, how did it come from? Where did it come from? I mean, was it just we were stumbling around and God just kind of came over and just said, hey, here's some stuff? No, it actually came from a source. Just like disease, just like sin came from three places. The world, Satan, and the flesh. God's salvation comes from three wonderful places. The first one is mercy. The first one is mercy. I have to go back to verse, three, uh, verse 4 for that. God who's rich in mercy. So there's one big word, mercy, and there's one little word right next to it. Right? A preposition. What is a preposition? I'm just trying to describe where it is, right? In mercy. God is rich in mercy. He's rich in mercy, right? Um, God loves to give people mercy. The one thing about our God is, is he gives people what they don't deserve at all. I don't deserve it. You don't deserve it, right? Mercy is completely given by God out of his love. And there's nothing you can do to earn it. There's nothing, nothing. I mean, you can't say, well, if I be good today, God will give me more mercy. No, it doesn't work like that. God just gives mercy. He's just merciful. That's his character. You can't make him unmerciful. That's who he is. You come to God, you ask for mercy. What are you going to get? Uh, mercy. You know, Jesus put it this way. If you ask God for his spirit, he's not going to give you a rock or a stone or a serpent. He's going to give you his spirit. Why? He's good. He is merciful. Right? And he gives people what they don't deserve. Right? I am only here and you're only here because of God's mercy. It doesn't matter how intelligent you are or not intelligent or whatever you're not or whatever you are. It is mercy. It is simply God extending his hand to those who don't deserve it. But the second thing he does is grace. Look at verse 7. In order that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. We'll come back to that verse in a moment. For by grace you have been saved through faith. By grace. The word grace, and there's a little preposition, by, right? Rich in mercy. Saved by grace. What in this word grace? It's a wonderful word. It means just simply the kindness of God. It simply just means that God um, just wants to extend his generosity to you. He's simply just, he's a kind God. He's merciful and he's kind. You ever met somebody like that? No? Rare, isn't it, today? Somebody who just, he's just so merciful. And when I talk to him, he's so kind. <laughs> like, who can be like that? God. He's the only one. He's the only one who can be kind and merciful. And this particular English word is fascinating because we have this idea that people resist grace, Right? People resist grace all the time, right? You try to do something for someone. No, 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 I don't want to do that. No, don't do that. Hey, can I go? No, I got it. I got it. I got it. I mean, you said it. No, 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 I got it. I got it. It's like we can't. There's just something about us. We can't even accept it. It's like we fight against it because we some, somehow I feel better if I, if I work for it. I feel better if I, if I did something for it. 
Forget that idea with God. God just says, look, you need to get it from me because you can't earn this one. You can't have it any other way. And that's the challenge. It's a challenge in our world today when you preach the gospel that people think that they could just be good enough to make it to heaven. That could just be good. Oh, man, you tell them about grace. Oh, pastor, think I'll, I'll do it the other way. I'll earn it. I'll, you know, be good. And the majority of people in America believe that. And unfortunately, the churches have made that thinking without ever understanding truly what grace is, right? It is not of good works. It is not of good works that you're going to be saved. And here's grace, the most wonderful word, one of the most wonderful words in the Bible. And it's simply, I'll describe it like this. Good works won't get you in, but sin won't keep you out. That's grace. And grace, his grace means that you cannot do good works to get there. You can't even be good enough to get there. But also grace says to the sinner, your sins will not keep you out. And so grace becomes this really powerful thing in people's minds because to a self-righteous church attendee and religious person, what? You're telling me that that bum is going to get there and he lived his life that way? Shooting up heroin? Sleeping around? Drug addict? Smoking weed all the time? That guy's going to get in when I've been trying to be so good. And I've been praying all the time and attending church all the time and feeding the dog and taking care of the cat. And you, mean, you mean that doesn't help? Nope. Oh. <laughs> Meals on wheels is not going to help? <laughs> you know, you do good things. It might be good for somebody to do. Don't ever use it to twist God's arm and say, let me in. It won't work. And this is why grace is so offensive to people. That's what I meant by offense. You mean that guy? I know what he did. I know what he used to do. And he's just going to ask God to forgive him? Oh, come on. Amen. People have problems with the thief on the cross. You mean that guy's going to be in paradise? And those yeah. good religious Jews on the, on the, on, you know, on the, uh, making fun of Jesus on the cross, that they live to be righteous, they're not getting in? Nope. But that guy is. Why? Mercy and grace. Mercy and grace. Is that offensive to people sometimes? It's church, well-meaning church attendees. <laughs> Got the name on a, on a chair and the name on a plaque and the name on the church. And nope, good works won't get you in. Bad sins or the sins won't keep you out. That's how wonderful grace is. It makes everybody equal. There's no room for pride. Where's your pride? That's what it says in verse 9. Not a result of works, lest anybody should boast. It's not going to be about boasting. No one's going to be in heaven saying, oh, how good I was. Man. You have no idea how good I was. I went to church every day, twice on Sundays. You didn't. And somebody comes up and says, well, I went to church you know, twice a day. And there's this boasting, right? There's this boasting that happens. And God says, no, none of that boasting. Well, any man should work. God hates boasting because we're all saved by grace. I saved you by grace. And that kills pride in any fellowship, by the way. When we remind ourselves about grace, that kills pride. Not one person here is better than the other. And that person here has been saved by any other way except grace. right? So no matter how you lived your life before Christ, no matter what you did before Christ, whether you lived it this way, you lived it that way, you were a good moral religious person, or you were just heathenistic in your thinking and lived it up in drugs and alcohol, and it doesn't matter. There's nobody here better because we've all saved by grace. So I can't trust my good works to get me there. Nope. And my sins won't keep me out. Nope. Hallelujah for the sinners. The greatest news for the religious person. Ugh, you mean that guy? <laughs> and you see, the challenge of grace is we think we're better. We think we're better than that person. We actually think because we didn't shoot up the heroin thing and we didn't go sleep around all the time that we're actually better than that guy. And God says, no, it's all by grace. So there's no boasting in it. 
And it's through faith. Did you see that? It's through faith. And that's the other thing. It's through faith. A gift has to be received. A gift has to be received. The problem with humanity is we refuse the help. I don't want the help. And it has to be received. And so we're saved by grace, yes, but it's also through faith, meaning we have access to this grace. We have access to this grace, Paul says, through faith. So faith becomes this vehicle to access the grace of God. It's a beautiful thing, meaning we can have access to God. God gives us this measure of life, and then we can respond by faith to him. It's grace, right? And all grace is is you just stretch out your hand and receive the gift. That's all faith is, really. It's to believe that God means what he says. Believe what he says. I do. And it's not exclusive, by the way. It's not exclusive. Gift is not some ex- uh, gr- uh, faith is not some exclusive thing that like some people have and some people don't. No. Meaning that grace is available for all to have. As, is, as Paul said in Titus, the grace of God has appeared to some people. All oh, men. And so all men have access to this, but they have to have faith. They have to access it through faith. Now, that's on them. That's the, 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 the dead person has to come alive, but the dead person now has to decide. Am I going to believe? Am I going to have faith? And so this beautiful word, faith, right? The word that is used here. Now, I'm going to go back to verse 8 real quick because I, I promise I'll explain this. Because some people have used this verse to say, see, it's none of man. It's all God. Well, it's all God in that he has to lift us up. Absolutely. But there has to be a response. There has to be a response. And this is what it says. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Now, I've got a question for you. Two weeks from now, I'll have, you have questions for me. I have questions for you. What is the gift of God? It's interesting, isn't it? What is the gift of God? Okay, so you have three choices in that verse. Salvation is a gift of God. Grace is a gift of God. Or faith is a gift of God. Which one is it, huh? And people fight and argue about this, and theological books have been made. Faith. Pisteo. Simply the word means pisteo. It means to believe or to trust or to have faith towards something or faithfulness in something. That's what it means, right? Uh, you have to exercise it. You have to respond to it. That's what the word it simply implies, that there's a response to it. So what is actually given? Is grace given? Is faith given? Is salvation given? Let's turn to Romans 5 very quickly. Romans 5, and let's read it very quickly because I'm almost done with time. But what is given? Because this is the big, the big problem, right? Some people say, everything is given to some people. You can't do anything about it. It's simply, you either have it or you don't. Romans 5.2. What I would like to know is, how does Paul use the word grace and the word faith? Uh, Verse 1 of chapter 5 of Romans. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained our introduction by faith or access to this grace by faith, in which we stand, and we exalt and hope of the glory of God. Simply meaning, this grace is available, and faith is the means to have access to this grace. But how are you justified? Did you read verse 1? By faith. You are justified by faith. Go back to Ephesians. And look what it says in Ephesians 3.7. 3.7. Paul, which I am minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. Grace and gift go together. Faith, justification. Grace, gift. Look at 4-7. You don't forget it, 3-7, 4-7. Just one chapter over. But to each one of us, grace is has been given or was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. It's a gift. Grace is a gift. Grace is the gift. Salvation is the gift. How are you justified? Meaning, how are you declared not guilty of the sins committed? 
through faith. So meaning this, faith is the vehicle that gives us access to this grace. You're like, Pastor, why is this so important? Because I, I just want to clarify it. Man, man makes systems, like belief systems, right? And the systems go like this. There's a certain way to believe something and a certain way not to believe in something. But what the Bible teaches sometimes interferes with man's systems. So you got a choice. Either throw away the system or throw away the Bible. Unfortunately, many people have decided that the system is probably better. In some systems, faith comes after you're born again. Faith comes after you're born again. It's called Reformed, it's called Calvinism, whatever you want to call it. It's called Monergism. You know, there's different ways to describe it. Meaning that God has to, God does everything. Does absolutely everything. And faith, you actually get faith after you're born again. You actually get faith after you're born again. That means that God saves you, God regenerates you, and then you believe. It's called monergism, meaning that God does everything because faith is basically, faith cannot come before that because otherwise faith will be like a work. Right? And that is what faith in some circles has become, that forget faith, just worry about grace. Yes, we're saved by grace, but how do we have access to this grace? Does God just say, here you go? Or do I have to stretch out my hand to receive it? Right? According to what the Bible teaches is this, and you have a choice. Does faith come before being born again or does it come after being born again? I have to go back to my Bible, and it says that is this grace I've been saved through faith. And that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. What is gift? What is the gift? Grace. Salvation. He's given it to you as a gift. The word dorea, dorea, is a gift. Here's your gift. What is it? Salvation. My kindness. How do I get it, God? Through faith. See, if faith came after that, if you just say, well, God just saved you, you're born again, then you get faith, then there's a problem because now faith has become something I have to do, like a work. But it's not through works, it's through faith. Believing, trusting. It is the faith that justifies. I'm not justified by works. I'm justified by faith. Faith has to come before regeneration. I only say that not to confuse you, but to untangle a lot of things that we often hear, and here we go, I wonder what the Bible says about it. But let's continue, because verse 10, oh boy, I ran out of time. I started a little late, so maybe get a couple of minutes. Okay, good. Um, somebody's going to shoot it down. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship, Created in Christ Jesus for good actions. The word is action. Erge means action. We think of works, but think of action. Created for good actions, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Right? Now, here's the beautiful part about it. If people have this misconstrued, misconstrued idea. If good works don't get me in, that means I don't have to have good works after that. If I can't get into heaven by good works, that means... Good works don't mean anything. I'm saved. Hallelujah. Press the elevator. I'm out of here. And you ride the elevator all the way to heaven. That's not what the Bible ever said. <laughs> it says that you were not saved by works. Absolutely. But here's a beautiful preposition. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Three letters. F-O-R. For good works. So I've been saved by grace in his mercy, through faith, for good works. That means that I am saved, I am called, I am sent out to become God's son or God's servant for the purposes of good works, right? It's part of our faith. It's works, we're not saved by works, but it's part of our faith, meaning that as we walk with God, and I would walk with Jesus, Good works become part of it. 
We're not saved by them, but we're saved for them. You were saved for good works. You were saved, and there's a wonderful word here, um, God's grace, has uh, his workmanship, poema. God is doing something, and God works something in you so you can work it out in the world. He works something in so you can work it out. What does he work in? Salvation. What do you work out? Salvation. Right? Your faith. He works it in, you work it out. Very simple how the Bible puts it sometimes, right? He works it in, you work it out. How does he do that? Well, he does, he does that through the Spirit, and we're going to get to that uh, in Ephesians uh, later on in the chapter, and in the next chapter as well, he's going to talk about the Spirit. But here's the fundamental thing for Christians. Where does good works fit into, Christian, into Christianity? We're not saved by them, but we're saved for them, meaning that God in his intention saved you for the purposes of serving this is where a lot of Christians fall off because they say, I'm saved, see you next week. And they don't serve. They don't get involved. They do nothing with their faith. They continue on just saying, I just have an intellectual faith. I just believe, I just believe. And forgetting that the word faith has to do with belief, but also action. It's an action word. It means to do or to believe or to act on it. We're saved by grace for good works. And he, here's the difference. I'll just talk about it in just the final, final few seconds. People have come up to me, even in this church a long time ago, and said, Pastor, I don't need to go to church because I know there are good unbelievers that do more work and better work than Christians. I know, Christ, I know unbelievers that are better than Christians. I said, really? What do they do? They're involved in this, they do this, they do that, and they do good works. They visit the hospitals, they do this. The great things, awesome things. And unbelievers are capable of doing that. But there is a great difference between a good work of a Christian and a good work of an unbeliever. What are the differences? Number one, it's God's work, first of all, for the Christian. It is his workmanship. God God's work is in you, so you can work it out. So first of all, the, 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 just the initial part of it, where does the good work of an unbeliever come from? Themselves. Where does the good work of a Christian come from? God. <laughs> he worked it in. He put that in. And it's a, it's a challenge, isn't it? Because we have to realize that as much as unbelievers do the good work, what am I supposed to be doing, right? When they face God... Uh, they had to realize that the good work that they did wasn't, wasn't in God. It was in them. Somebody benefited, but God did not start that work in them. Number two, God prepared it beforehand. God prepared it beforehand. A Christian does what God has prepared before them. What do you mean by that? It means that something God is wanting you to do today, that he's prepared. The question is what it is. Have you asked him? For today, we pray, Lord, what is it that you want me to do today? Because God has prepared it. Um, God has planned it in certain ways and certain things to do. Now, the question is, are you going to ask him? I'm going to ask him. You can ask him. But we have to do the good works because God has prepared it. He worked it in. He's already laid it out for us. God has planned it. It may be something that you never thought about doing, right? Or maybe it's something that... God doesn't want you to be involved in that, and he wants you to be involved in this. You ever thought about that? Because you're like, man, I got to do that. Wait a minute. Is that God's work in my life, or is it just me wanting to do it? Number three, a Christian's, does, uh, a Christian's doing good work can do so much more than an unbeliever doing good work. Now, we could all feed the dog. We could all watch the kids. We could all do, the, you know, do good works. However, there's something that a good work an unbeliever cannot do. Because an unbeliever can only deal with the physical. He can only deal with your physical needs. A Christian can do so much more. Not only the physical, but something that no unbeliever can do. Deal with the spiritual needs. Evangelism. Sharing Christ. Meet the spiritual need. That's the good work that God wants us to establish in us. Is the other good work good? Absolutely. What did James say? Visit the poor. Visit the orphan. 
Take care of the wood. Isn't that, that's true worship, Paul, uh, James says. That is true worship. Never neglect that. But the calling of every Christian is to do more than just the physical need. Meet the spiritual need. How do you meet the spiritual need? Share Christ with them. Tell them about Jesus. That is the need of every man, woman, and child. That is the greatest need that you can meet, that an unbeliever can never come close to that need because they only can think of the physical need, right? All above, all, this need is above all the other needs. Meet the spiritual need. So the harvest is plentiful, the labors are few, and a line goes to the human race. This line from Adam all the way to the end. There's no grading in God. <laughs> There's no... C minuses or B plus or anything like that. All of humanity. There's two categories of people. Two categories of people. You just read it. You're dead or you're alive. There's nothing else. There's no half dead, no half alive. It's either alive or dead. Alive in Jesus, dead in our sins. Outside of Christ or inside of Christ. That's the conclusion of verses 1 through 10. Everybody here, or everybody that listens, everybody that watches, it's either on one side or the other. Pastor, I don't want to be dead. I want to be alive. Praise the Lord for that. I didn't tell you that. God did. He might have used my words. He might have used some of you guys' words, but God is working in you. If you think, if you just think that way, like, I want to be alive. God's working in you. Now, what do we need? Trust him. Trust them to receive that grace. It's available. It's right there. It's available for you to have. And God has created good works for you to do. And so if you're a Christian today, Pastor, I was dead and now I'm alive. Pastor, I was a sinner and now I'm alive. Pastor, I need the grace of God. Yes, I understand. What am I supposed to do now? Ask God what he wants you to do. It's as simple as that, isn't it? Created for good works. What are, Lord, I'm not saved by them. Absolutely not. But there's, say, there's something to do that is beyond our capacity to understand. And God says, do this good work is for us to do for his good pleasure. He's going to do it in us because he's going to put it in you. Now you need to work it out. That's the challenge, isn't it? The here and now is not to sit on our churches, not to sit in our church seats, not to sit and and just go from Sunday to Sunday, and I hear the same thing, and I do, and to do something with it today. Just go, Lord, what do you want me to do? I'm, gonna go, I'm either going to go through a drive through right? I'm either going to go home. I'm either going to meet somebody today. I, maybe I'm just going to be alone. I don't know. But I'm going to be doing something. Lord, in those possibilities, what did you want me to do? Because if that verse is true, verse 10, you are his workmanship. You all, right? You all his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. They're already there. They have been laid before you if you are willing to take them on. They'll be yours. What a blessing, isn't it? He's prepared it. He saved us by grace. He laid it out his mercy for you to have. And now he says, would you have trust? Would you have uh, faith in me? Would you trust me for what I'm going to do? Yes, Lord. I believe I receive you. I trust you. Great. Get on with it. Now you're saved for good works. Now all the things you thought about doing before, they, didn't, they weren't going to get you in. But now, because I'm working in you, it's going to be working out. I'm going to do something a little bit different as, as we close. I pray that the Lord... His spirit had been working in your heart. And I'm going to ask something very different. Does anyone here want to come up? And in a few minutes that we have left, before our worship team plays the last song, would you give a synopsis, very, very short synopsis, of how you were dead and you're alive in Christ today? What changed? What happened? How did it happen? And I prayed this morning. I said, Lord, I don't know where that thought came from, but I believe today there's somebody here that really was touched by the Lord to tell somebody that this is what God did in them. I have no idea who it is, but I trust that it was God and taking a big risk <laughs> to say, 
the Lord wants somebody to come up and tell them, tell us what he did. Should you come up? Because God's been putting that on your heart already. And I'm just telling, me, telling you what he told me and trusting that God will do his work. Would you come up? I don't know who it is, by the way. Well, we'll just have the, team, the worship team come up and sing the final song. You don't have to even raise your hand. You just come up. I, I know God's told, told me somebody. That's, I believe God told me to some, that somebody wants to do that. God's working in somebody. Just a few seconds. It doesn't have to be long. Um, we can shut off the, the, the live stream and the YouTube stream, but um, Brother Art, 